Hi, I'm Caroline Harding, the Executive Director. Really happy to be here today. And I hope you enjoy our presentation. At the end of the presentation, we're going to do a live Q&A so you can feed any questions you have into the chat. And Emily is gonna be our moderator and pull those questions out. And uh, we can hopefully have a nice lively uh, rapid fire Q&A at the end. Um, and we really invite you to uh, sit back and enjoy and um, you know we like to have questions uh, so feel free to do that. So we're going to start you off with a quick video. It's a video that was made by one of our interns in house in Smart Ice and it gives you an indication of what we're all about so it sort of will set the stage of what Shauna and I are going to deliver to you today. SmartEyes is a social enterprise that empowers Indigenous communities across Canada's north to travel safer on ice. Because of climate change, that ice is becoming thinner and less predictable. It is becoming more dangerous to travel on. Enter SmartEyes as an internationally recognized award-winning climate solution. It combines Indigenous knowledge, sensor technology, and satellite imagery to help communities safely navigate hazardous ice. Our social enterprise business model commits to maximizing social impact and creating positive community change, while collaboratively delivering ICE information services with communities for communities across the Arctic. Smart ICE puts innovative technology into the hands of communities so they can adapt their travel plans to unprecedented ICE conditions. It trains local operators to use Smart ICE sensors to monitor ICE thickness along community travel routes. Operators are trained to deploy autonomous sensors called smart buoys to monitor ice conditions near and far from their communities. Operators also run regular thickness surveys along community trails using a smart homo dick which is pulled behind a snowmobile. The community receives this travel safety information on smartphones and computers through the internet platform Siku as well as local radio and posted maps in public places. SmartEyes is assembling the smart buoy sensors in our northern production center in Nain, Nunetsiavut, where we employ Inuit youth from our technological production and employment readiness program. SmartEyes trains Inuit to be the producers, operators, and technicians of its technology, enhancing literacy and essential skills, as well as technical skills using an approach grounded in indigenous ways of knowing and learning. Smart Ice training programs are culturally and contextually responsive, supporting Inuit to thrive and prosper. Smart Ice convenes community management committees made up of elders, youth, and community representatives to decide how Smart Ice should operate in each of its service communities and to make recommendations on other ways that Smart Ice can support safe travel. For example, the Community Management Committee in Pond Inlet has documented its accumulated wisdom of ice travel safety so Smart Ice can help young and inexperienced users stay safe through the adoption of traditional knowledge and skills. Their travel safety posters and maps, for instance, teach young hunters how to plan, prepare, identify, and test the ice for safety and to be aware of frequently dangerous ice areas during different seasons. By sharing the community's accumulated ice knowledge in these new ways, Smart Ice is enabling younger generations to adapt to unpredictable ice changes while also strengthening community resilience and well-being. Smart Ice is working with northern businesses and resource industries to demonstrate how its ice information services can help mitigate negative effects of climate change on their operations. For example, Smart Ice is helping to build climate-adapted winter tourism and fisheries in which travel safety is paramount for market confidence and growth and operational planning and profitability. Support of Smart Ice services by governments is a good return on investment because reducing ice travel risk in northern communities avoids emergency situations and costly search and rescue responses. With current and planned operations in 24 locations across Inuit Nunungat, Smart Ice continues to address new community needs for ice monitoring services. 
Last year, in Nunavut alone, we provided over 5,600 hours of employment, trained 46 operators, employed 33 youth, and engaged 50 elders and community members. Our goal is to work with every community that needs our service. While CIS data are collected, mapped, and shared by federal government agencies, their focus is primarily on shipping, not community travel. To address this information gap, SmartIce is co-designing a training program to prepare local operators to make the first time regular ICE travel safety maps for their communities using Inuit knowledge and observations together with satellite image interpretation. Due to changing climate, freshwater ice on lakes and rivers is experiencing shorter and less predictable seasons for safe community resupply. Smart Ice is adapting its system and services for freshwater ice monitoring to the benefit of First Nation communities across the Arctic interior. Through these novel actions and social innovations, Smart Ice is harnessing the vast potential of Indigenous women and men, especially youth, to embrace science, technology, and traditional knowledge as a vehicle for sustainable employment, economic development, and well-being in their communities. Smartice offers climate change adapt adaptation tools to Indigenous communities across the North and engage with those communities. Our goal as Smartice is to ensure that Indigenous knowledge is highly collaborated um, in that process and innovating with modern technology. This is to ensure that the sea ice that uh, Inuit used is safe to travel on. Smart Ice is working with Indigenous youth within their communities to locally manufacture the technology. We use both the Smart Hamotic and the Smart Buoy to monitor the sea ice, but currently are working primarily with the Smart Buoy with the youth. So I'm wondering um, if anyone has experienced climate change um, in their own way. Shauna, can you see the results? Yeah. Okay. So a late, uh, eight people have experienced uh, climate change in their community. And that's what we're experiencing as well as people that we know that are in communities across the north, um, certainly across the north, where they say that climate change is uh, affecting uh, communities uh, quicker than anywhere else in the world. So why smart ice? So climate change is transforming environments. Uh, this year alone, um, our northern production lead in Maine, the Natsibit, uh, had a spring jacket on right till the end of February, and it should have been winter starting in uh, December. But the weather was quite warm, it rained a lot, there, it was really all over the map. So sea ice is decreasing and it's less predictable. And the two time frames that it's the most dangerous is the freeze up of the sea ice and it is the breakup of the sea ice. And this is two really, really critical times. So this was a couple of years ago, and this was central Newfoundland and Labrador. And that is not in the Arctic. It's not north at all. Uh, and it snowed. And we had a 30 centimeter snowstorm in the, at the end of June. So you wonder what's happening with climate. And uh, there's no rhyme or reason about the climate any, anymore. But for Inuit and other Indigenous communities, the sea ice is incredibly important for them and their communities. It is the road to see their friends and their family, to get food and provide for their family, and it, but it is also a space for Inuit to practice and to continue to learn their Inuit culture. Um, here we have Andrew Ariak. He lives in Pond Inlet and is one of our operators. 
you can see that he is voicing his opinion and emphasizing the importance um, of the sea ice to not only him, but to his community and what I can imagine for everyone else who continually use the ice. Here we also have a video clip of one of our board members, Derek Paddle, talking about his way of life from when he was younger compared to this year. Well, you know, we reminisce about um, when I started to, when after I got married on my own in the uh, late 70s and started my family, we were living on the land for the most part, trapping and hunting and making a living from the land. And I could cross over to inlets. This would be, uh, you know, late 70s, early 80s. Mm. I could cross over to inlets on at least two foot of sea ice in mid-November. Now this year, well after the new year in probably the second week, third week into January, before we could cross over into that same area to get to where our traditional hunting and trapping grounds are too. So I reminisce with my children and my grandchildren, and these are the changes that I've seen in a very short period of time. So we're all concerned about if this trend is uh, a part of our future. I think our future is, our way of life is gonna come, if not to an end, it's gonna come to a very different way that we're used to in a very short period of time. And it's almost like they wouldn't be able to have that same way of life, or they had that, that, that same experience that you've had. We taught our children, uh, both myself and my wife, we taught our children the values of living on the land, how to live on the land. They, they both know what it takes to survive on the land and how to survive on the land. But, you know, my grandchildren, all four of them live in southern Ontario. We bring them back. Unfortunately, we haven't seen them for a year now because of COVID. Mm. But we bring them back and we teach them. We teach the values of, of our lifestyle, of their lifestyle, of their parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, you know, go back, you know, several thousand generations, and, um, you know, this is this is our homeland. And it's changing right in front of your very eyes. It's changing right before our eyes, and uh, it's very scary and uh, very concerning, and I don't know if it's false expectations, but I'm really hoping that things are going to slow down and things are going to revert to back to what they were, but I've been very blessed and fortunate that I've traveled in all four Inuit regions in Canada, Inuit, Nunukuk, uh, right across the north. I've traveled to Greenland on several occasions, many occasions over the years, and I talk, I connect with the people who live in the communities, and uh, all across the north, right across the north, is the same trend as what, what we're seeing in, in Nunukseavut. In 2010, and um, this year, actually, Nain was having an unusually warm winter with warmer weather. The picture here shows two people from Nain and their snowmobile stuck in slush. This had become a common occurrence um, then for people who travel on the ice. It is critically important that when you travel, you travel with someone and you tell another person where you are going. Here I have another clip to show you of our Northern Production Lead, um, Rex Howell, talking about the impacts. Well, a lot of people just won't, be able, won't go out to take the chance. Um, you know, Derek said people go through the ice and people here have gone through the ice as well. Um, so a lot of the people won't take the chances of traveling on the sea ice. Um, so they won't be able to go off to their traditional fishing grounds to, um, you know, get fish or beverages that would help offset the high cost of living in Nain over, you know, um, here in Labrador, a lot of the people here go get wood to help heat their house. Mm. And if they don't feel it's safe enough, you know, they won't get the wood to help, uh, again, offset the high cost of living for, to heat their house here in Maine. So what we do is we map and monitor the hazardous ice conditions. And just like Derek and Rex had just talked about, this interview that they had was only a couple of weeks ago. So it's very fresh in their minds and certainly in Labrador and throughout the rest of Inuit Nunangat, uh, we've been hearing people tell, tell the stories about the weather and, and how much warmer it has, but without access to cultural activities and country food, this is really presenting a problem. So Smart Ice responds to the communities, uh, to their priorities. So we engage with the communities, we ask them what their priorities are, and then we assist where we can. So how we do that is through a couple of different ways, but one of them is our technology. And we combine our tech, our traditional knowledge, uh, sorry, 
Inuit traditional knowledge with the technology. So there's a couple of um, pieces that we have. Shauna already talked about the smart buoy. So the smart buoy as illustrated here, as you can see, it's a big tall piece of equipment. It's like a big thermometer and there's a strip of 60 thermistors running down the middle of the buoy. And the buoy measures the, the temperature of the ocean, the sea ice, the snow and the air. At the top of the buoy, there is a modem and the modem talks to the Iridium satellite and it can have it talk once an hour, once a day, once every two days, it depends on the time of the year. The information comes back down in, in raw data and then we manipulate that data to be able to share that data with the communities and I'll show you how to do that, how we do that now in just another slide or so. So this is a stationary buoy. The second one is the mobile sensor. And I think that uh, we saw that a little bit of a video clip. Shauna might be able to press play on this one as well. Um, it, the, it's the mobile sensor that pulls the sled and in the sled is the sensor called the smart comatic. It measures through conductivity through the ice, uh, through the ice is the seawater. And in real time says how thick the ice is underneath. So in this particular illustration, you can see the yellow circle. Um, it was 4.8 feet thick um, under the snowmobile. So of course we have to get beyond the freeze up and we have to be careful with the, with the, with the breakup with this particular piece of technology. But that's where the ice terminology comes in, the visuals, what does the ice sound like? What does it uh, look like? Is it clear? All these different attributes around the ice that the traditional knowledge uh, it really combines it all together and makes it into one really neat package of uh, data points for decision making. Then what happens is when the data is ready to disseminate, we work with an organization called SIKU and SIKU is a platform and the organization is another social enterprise like us, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a couple of minutes. Um, it is kind of like Facebook for the North and you go in and you choose your community and you can go in and see what's happening. This particular diagram that you can see here, it's the different colors. It tells how thick the ice is in those areas where, where the comatic has gone. And so you can see the ice is seven feet thick, five to seven feet thick in some areas and three feet thick in a couple of other dangerous areas, just a little bits of red in that peach color. So you can, anybody can go on, register themselves, pick a community. There is a little buoy just above the green portion and it also measures the thickness of the buoys and the management committee um, within each community um, decides where the buoys are going to be put and where the comma tick is going to be driven. So this is a really neat platform that you can get on, on online on a laptop and on your cell phone, which is kind of neat. So you can map, you can take a picture of the map, get it on your cell phone, your tablet or whatever, and then you can, you can take that route. That's pretty cool. It works well and uh, it's quite unique to be able to do that. And you can post pictures and if you see animals and different types of ice, etc. So we're on to poll two. Shauna's got another question for you. So this is always an interesting question about youth. What can youth do? How many youth are engaged? So this is pretty encouraging what we see so far, Shauna. <laughs> it is. Yeah. And so 75% of the group who participated um, do engage in climate change activities, which is always exciting to hear. Um, the question we have now as a company is how, um, what makes us different from everyone else? And so we have another question asking if you know what a social, prize, social enterprise is. Mm, interesting results so far. Mm -hmm. 
So this is going to be fun because we're going to we're going to tell you what our social enterprise is all about in a couple of minutes. Excellent. Okay, so that's good. Some of you know and some of you don't know. Good job. All right, over to you, Shauna. Before we go into explain what um, a social enterprise is and what we do, I'm going to show you a clip of Smart Ice hosting Minister Dan Vendel in the Northern Production Center and show you a snippet of that conversation we had. We all know that the impacts that climate change are having uh, uh, on on everyone's lives, and especially in the north, where climate change is occurring uh, three times faster than it is in the south. And I think it's a, it's important we all work together to understand how to uh, better adapt to the uh, rapidly changing climate. Thank you for having the opportunity to speak, to you Minister. Starting the 80s, and that the uh, you could start seeing the effects of of the climate change, even though we said it's coming, it's coming, uh, you know, uh, we we noticed that, you know, it was not always, uh, you could not, not always depend on the traditional knowledge because situations with regard to the ice conditions were changing so fast that uh, you couldn't rely on uh, traditional travel routes anymore because of the way that the uh, ice was taking longer to form or melting quicker, things like that. Uh, just this past this past year, for example, uh, we could go to open water that was just past just past uh, uh, Fort Sarver, which is not far from here. It's just out out the side of the community, and all the uh, big animals like polar bears and that are close by. And for the first time. In recent history, the second time in my history anyway, we had a polar bear coming to our community, which was very, very uh, upsetting. And then you have the people who, um, you know, will take that risk of actually traveling over the sea ice when it's not necessarily safe to get to their hunting ground, fishing ground, or like jo uh, Joseph mentioned, uh, Judas, to their cabin. So, I mean, um, you know, people are people are unsure of the ice conditions, um, as opposed to back when it was less affected by climate change, and more people are taking those chances, and uh, more people are. A lot of people say the ice is a lot more un unpredictable and it's harder to read, and which leads to people either being unsure and not actually going to their traditional hunting or fishing grounds, and a lot of people here get wood for heating as well. Um, so a lot of people won't, won't actually travel over the sea ice to go get their winter wood supply to keep warm. Um, so that just adds on to the high cost of living in northern Canada. So I mean, um, they, with the hunting, people are not taking the chances and they don't have their winter food supply or they don't, you know, have enough of their traditional food. So I mean, um, that has a huge impact and as you know, in the north, um, the food supply is a huge issue, so that just leads to that as well. So, I mean, it's having a huge effect. So, this kind of uh, technology is very, very important to uh, to the communities. And, uh, you know, Smart Ice is just one avenue that uh, is here in Nain, is here in Nunatsaut, and it's working. It's employing people, it's training people, getting them ready for uh, preparing them for other employment. Uh, in some cases, and also uh, encouraging them to uh, uh, carry on their education. Some of these students now that have been uh, the first group, you know, some of them have gone back to school, which is a very good uh, good indication of uh, how uh, beneficial this program is to them. The technology itself originates in science, so you'll find it on an icebreaker at the North Pole, you'll find it in Antarctica. But what we did, so originally the scientist Christian Haas from, in Germany, he was using it to measure changes in sea ice to 
measure the rate of climate change. And what I did was, work, who I knew Christian, I worked with him to say, how can we make this operational for communities? So instead of it collecting information and the data being analyzed two or three months later for scientific purposes, we developed it with help of uh, uh, support from the government of Canada, we started to make it real time information. So as the operator travels on their snowmobile, up on the handlebars is a small computer that's telling them the thickness of the ice below them. And that's really important for the safety of the operator, but also uh, when they go back to the community, that all everywhere they travel is immediately, that information is immediately made available to the community. And wow. then we also have a stationary sensors that just sit in the ice at places that the community decides are really dangerous or early indicators. And they every day they just send back to satellite the information on how thick the ice is, how much snow is on the ice, and also the local temperature. I think the youth component is is really original, and and I've loved that about this project. So I, I'd like to ask Shauna a question, if I could. And you know, you're a youth intern with this project uh, for quite a while now. You know, what's probably one of the most important things you've learned here, or what would be your big takeaway? as part of your experience as a young person who've grown up in the Nazivut and is now engaged with this project? Um, that's a really great question. <laughs> um, I think there's a lot of components that Smart Ice puts uh, to helping with youth. Um, a big part of that is that they hire uh, workers within the community. Um, so whoever they can train by, they are either within the community or the people coming into the community are um, they explain themselves they have time to make icebreakers get to know one another to communicate and just to create a safe space for youth to feel comfortable within their environment and not necessarily foreign in a space that they already know the business uh, approach or the social enterprise approach that smart eyes takes really um, emphasizes the indigenous values and belief systems that each um you know it uh, Nunangat sector has, and they uh, respect that, whether it's through the land, whether it's maximizing their resources, whether it's one-on-one -on -one communication. Um, it's been uh, learning that process and that model through Smart Ice has been really interesting. I think it's been very important to Smart Ice that we have that social enterprise approach so that our primary concern is having that positive impact in the communities. And from the perspective of uh, Inuit self-determination, in these communities, the elders and the representatives of community organizations are the ones who dictate how smart I should operate. I really would love to visit uh, your territory and uh, and get on the ice, get on the land, and uh, I commend uh, everyone who uh, who's uh, played a role in this, and I appreciate uh, all the work you're doing. Thank you. So I had the great opportunity during the first placement of my job to work in Nain from where I'm from with Rex Halwell, who is our Northern Production Lead, as well as our support worker, Todd Perry. This location would support um, our would house our supplies for the smart buoy, the parts for the buoy, but to also help and engage youth um, in what we do and what we believe in. So the social enterprises seek to maximize their profits while maximizing their benefits to society and their environment. They are strategies that are in place to make positive differences in so for social benefits. Our program that we offer is to help and allow the youth to pursue their dreams and their goals. Any profits that Smart Ice make is used to help fund our programs given in different communities across the North. The choice of using the business model aligns really well with Inuit societal values, um, Inuit care, respect, and learn from their surroundings, which lead to innovation and resourcefulness. 
This is important to note because we want to work and we want to collaborate with Inuit within their communities. Incorporating their values within our model allows us to tag team with the community as a joint effort um, and not just one-sided. Through a social enterprise, we are able to improve employment opportunities and skills for youth that we hire. So we are run by a board of directors. We have 10 volunteer board of directors. We are incorporated without sheer capital, which means that we're not for profit. And our business model is the, is the social enterprise. And the board has worked quite hard on developing the mission, the vision, our values, and our strategic directions. So our vision is that we will work with Inuit to conduct community-based environmental monitoring that contributes to their cultural sustainability and informs land, water, and sea ice use. So it's very clear in what we do. Our mission, a leading northern social enterprise focusing on climate change adaptation tools, which are smart buoy and our smart commentic, and we do some maps and some training besides, integrating traditional knowledge, which is paramount to this entire project, of the sea ice with technology, maximizing the benefits again for local communities, especially youth, which is one of the uh, shining stars in our organization, of course, is the Northern Production Center in Nain, where we, where we train the youth. So we're what's considered a WISE, a work integrated social enterprise that we produce the innovative ice monitoring technologies. Um, and that, those technology uh, help provide um, the data so that people can be safe on the ice. So we deliver the training, especially to those that are neat. It's considered the neat population, which is they're not in, they're not in it's currently attached to education, employment, or training. And we aim to reduce any barriers that we possibly can to bring people into our program. And we'll talk about the program now uh, in just upcoming. So the idea here is that um, you don't need a resume to get in the door. We just need to get you in the door to have a conversation. So instead of youth to having to try to break down the barriers, it's we are breaking down the barriers for the youth and opening the door, welcoming them in. And um, it's, it's quite interesting because some of these youth have never had uh, a job before or um, in any kind of a formal setting. So we developed this program and Shauna was at the very beginning of this. It was very exciting called the Smart Ice Employment Readiness and Technology Production Program. So there's a whole, a whole bunch of things that we do with the youth here, but it all comes down to they learn how to put our smart buoy together. And this is a picture of the cohort number one as they were learning all the bits and pieces and components. And what you can't see is all the circuit boards and all that kind of stuff inside these inside the buoy parts. But this was uh, this was a good day when they got their hands on the buoys. So the program and this is the social part of it. So the social enterprise piece, the social impact piece. We work with the youth and we help them with job search, resume building, how to, to do an interview, how to communicate one-on-one -on -one or in groups. Goal setting, financial literacy was huge. Social emotional learning. And we realized very quickly, right off the, the right off, right out of the gate, is that we really needed to have the social work support at the very beginning to make sure that we've provided a safe space, non-judgmental, and we meet the youth where they are to really reduce any barrier that we can so that the youth can do um, anything and work to their full potential. And that was a very, very important part for us. And then once we get through that social emotional piece and we have daily check-ins and see how everybody is feeling and um, everybody's starting to feel a little bit, um, you know, come more comfortable and we get through all this, the personal development, the human skills, then we teach them how to make the buoys and we do other training like WIMIS, which is workplace hazard materials, first aid, some lean 101 principles and that kind of thing. So they're getting lots of employment skills from us with certifications to go along with it that they're starting to build a resume. And then eventually um, they'll learn how to make the buoys. Some of the folks come back uh, to make our buoys when we get orders 
all the raw materials go off to the workshop and then the youth come back to make them. And other youth have decided to go back to college, finish off their high school. Uh, there's various and sundry things that they've decided to go on or to get uh, a higher paying job or something a bit more long-term, which is great. But we're introducing them to STEM activities and that's something that they're really, really enjoying is the science behind it all. So this, as you can see um, here, they're working on uh, little sections of the buoy here. There's probably the head, which is what the ladies are working on, which is where the modem might be. And then the guys are working on another piece. So they're learning a different language. They're learning a language of electronics, of uh, being grounded. Uh, when you see those baby blue mats with those, the, uh, you can see the, that baby blue bracelets on their arms, it's grounding them, that's a grounding mat. So they're learning hand tools, they're learning all kinds of really interesting things. And they're working in small teams, so they get to work together, they get to make mistakes together. And we actually have invested in what's called a training buoy, so they can make all the mistakes that they want. And it gets put together, taken apart, put together, taken apart. And it's no it's a no fault area that we do. You just, you learn and you learn and you take it apart and you do it again. And um, it's a very safe space to be. The impacts that Smart Eyes have has been um, wonderful. And it has been so nice to see from where we were to where we are now. In total, we have had three cohorts uh, with 15 youth. They had a huge scale of skill sets added to the resumes, huge success stories in terms of full-time employment um, after our program, uh, as well as applying for school, whether it be post-secondary, GED. Um, but we also like to invite the community members into our space. So we had had high school visits into the tech shop during the summer. Um, we had a cruise ship come and see the production center. Um, our doors are open to everyone and anyone who is interested in seeing what we do and what the youth work on. After the youth completes their first official buoy, so past the training buoy, like Caroline said, we would like to get a group picture to demonstrate um, their big accomplishment of assembling the buoy as a group. This is a reminder for them and for us um, to know where the youth were before coming in and after um, and how far they've progressed throughout our program. We also want to share with the world um, what they're working on and who are they making it for? Because again, we are very proud to have Inuit youth building um, technology for other Inuit. Once the program has been completed, the Northern Production Center holds an open house um, before COVID pre-COVID um, in the community where the youth are able to showcase their new skills and their advancements um, achieved throughout the program that we have offered. And they are able to show this to their friends, their family and other community members. Each um, individual gets a completion um, certificate from Smart Ice stating that they finished and completed the program. The youth are then able to bring um, their certificate off, um, to bring it home to show off to their friends and their family and to have a permanent reminder of their accomplishments. So this is just a fun trivia question for everybody. And we're gonna ask you this question first and then we're gonna show you the map. So if you're from Canada, or you know some Canadian geography, you may, you may get this one. So I think most of you know that Canada is quite big. So that's great. All right. Emily, do you want to share the answer with us? Yeah, so it's actually 4 million square kilometers. Which is a huge amount of space. So we are in the ocean industries. And when you look at the map of Canada, right from the west coast all the way to the east coast. So I'm located in St. John's, and that's where Shauna is. And Emily is, you, you can't see Goose Bay, but it's close to where the tag says Northwest River. And so um, that's where we are on the west, on the east coast. And we've got staff that run right from uh, Vancouver, uh, Alberta, Quebec, New Brunswick, Newfoundland and Labrador, 
uh, Baffin Island Pond Inlet, Johaven, as you can see, uh, is just down from Pond Inlet. And in all of these communities we are active in across Canada. So you think about all but one of these coastlines, uh, all, all of one of these borders are, um, which is the southern part, which is the states, uh, is all ocean surrounding us. So we are a huge ocean economy, a blue economy, and we are part of that ocean economy. So we're looking to grow uh, to other communities across Canada and through freshwater regions at the at very in northern parts of um, New um, Northwest Territories, the Yukon, uh, it could be uh, Northern um, Alberta, Saskatchewan, there's 10,000 kilometers of freshwater roads in Canada. And so that's another area of growth that we're having. At the end of every ice season, we have what's called uh, report cards and we, I, we call them smart moves and they're, they're our social impact report cards. So we're nearing the end of another ice season now coming up. Uh, probably in June or July of this year, and then we'll have new report cards come out. But this just gives you a snapshot of some of the things that we've done in Nunavut and in Nanatsivit. Um, right now in Nanatsivit, we're probably close to um, 8,500 hours of employment so far um, just this year. So we're really making an impact. Whereas before, if we weren't there, that would, that would, those employment hours wouldn't be in this community. So we're, we're creating these, um, these opportunities. Um, we have more buoys out now. We've got more smart comatics, more communities happening, but we love to uh, kind of um, share this, this news and our, our social impacts are, are what, um, what wakes us up in the morning uh, to do. And we're very, very passionate about that. Thank you for joining our session today and giving me and Caroline the opportunity to speak about Smart Eyes. Thank you very much. And uh, on behalf of Shauna and Emily and I, we're really happy to be here. And Shauna and Emily are um, alumni of Students on Ice. So thank you to Students on Ice for uh, inviting us to come along to the Youth Summit. So now this brings us into the live Q&A. So maybe what we could do is stop sharing and we could actually see each other's faces if anybody's interested in coming on screen. And we're open to questions. If you want to pop on your picture and your mic, or you can put them in the chat box. Hi, um, can I make a question? Can I ask you something? Sure. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, thank you for this amazing uh, presentation and also for the work that you have been doing in this region, which is amazing. Uh, for me, it's surprising because it's very different from, my, uh, from the place that I live. I live in Brazil and we don't have any snow in here, so <laughs> it's a, a very distant uh, situation. But I have a question, uh, actually two questions concerning the, the work you do in this place. So the first question actually would be about uh, the ge geoengineering using. So if you use uh, any kind of geoengineering technology to not only track, because I saw that the, the main focus is uh, the tracking of the ice conditions, but if you use this to fight the climate change as well, and uh, also the, the ice melting, etc. So the first one would be this. And the second one would be if you have been um, collecting data about people that have been displaced due to the ice melting conditions. So those are my two questions. And thank you again for the presentation. Oh, well, you're quite welcome. Those are great questions. Okay, I'm gonna answer your second question first. <laughs> So we collect data based on uh, the ice conditions. So uh, with the freeze up and the breakup are the most important part. So there's, there's uh, like cal uh, dates, freeze up, uh, thickness of the ice, all that kind of stuff. And the idea is, is that year after year after year, you can see, you can compare it to forecasts, trends, what's happening and all that kind of stuff. So we do collect that data, no problem. The data that we, don't collect is around the demographic data uh, and uh, about displacement of people. So far, 
what we've heard and we've read some articles on is that shorelines are eroding, eroding very fast. And so the, it's moving, you know, into people's territories where they live, like close to houses and stuff. So people are going to have to move sort of in different places within the community sometimes, which that's happening all over the world with, with coastlines erosion, uh, eroding. Um, so that particular piece of data that you're talking about, we don't collect, but Inuit are storytellers. So we, if they're, they're a ver they verbally um, tell the stories about what's happening and over and over. So it's about collecting those and it's about talking with Inuit with their traditional knowledge and hearing those stories and trying to capture them. Um, so I know it doesn't quite answer your question. So we know we don't collect it, but we're interested in collecting this kind of stuff. So we're working with communities to hear the stories and, and uh, kind of compare and contrast about what has happened, where are they today, and then having that, uh, that baseline to see where we can go forward. We're about three years old, so we're fairly new in this. The other thing that we believe in is that any data that we collect in communities, the communities own. And so we don't own that data and we work with the communities to whether how we will disseminate that data if they maybe they don't want to disseminate it whatever's on Siku is public but there could be other data and we would never do anything without that without the communities advising us as to what we can or cannot do, because that's their own that's their own data from their own community. Um, the second question. Um, do we use any geo technology. Are you talking about like geothermal type stuff? I'm not, I'm a bit confused. Start off, I mean, it's not my field. I have been studying this field recently. My, my original field is law, human rights, and international law. So, but I have been really interested about learning uh, more about geoengineering, which is kind of the, um, the field of engineering uh, that works with uh, to build technology to stop the, the, the climate change. So my, my main question is that if you besides tracking uh, the ice melting, the ice conditions, if you are also working for, I don't know, maybe to find a solution to stop the ice melting or other mm. uh, social and environmental problems that you okay. might have in this region. So, so we don't do that. We've got practices and processes to make sure that we're not adding to the carbon footprint and that making sure that we're not creating waste so that you know we, we take things out it's very low waste that kind of thing but we don't we don't try to stop the ice from melting because that that we can't do that but um, what we you know what we do do is enable and empower community members to adapt to the best that they possibly can to that to the, the changing climate. And uh, they, you know, it's the resilience, right? It's the resilience building. Okay, how can we do this? So it's different than last year, but we can do it this year. So that's what we're all about. Thank you, Thank you very much. Anybody else? Oh, Ron? Hello, everybody. Um, Hello, uh, Smart Eyes team. Uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. I'm uh, from Switzerland, and uh, we also have a little uh, uh, some some issues with ice melting, and uh, as you know, our glaciers are melting in the mountains. And I'm from uh, from Basel, which is next to the Rhine River, and the level of the Rhine River is also uh, decreasing. We have a lot of uh, variation and rainfall. So, uh, two years ago, the ships on the Rhine River were stopping uh, because the, the, the level of the river was so low, uh, the ships couldn't go through. So this was in the, in the summer. So this is increasing uh, over time. I just wanted to ask you about, uh, about um, your, um, when you started, of course you had to find money yeah, to, mm -hmm. to finance, you know, that, that the capital investment with the, the buoy and, and all the wires and all the technology. So how did you convince the different stakeholders was it easy <laughs> um so we're a little bit of 
I have to give you a little bit of history, so you're going to have to bear with me for this. So back in 2010, which Shauna had mentioned, Dr. Trevor Bell, who is our founding director, is a university research professor in the Faculty of Geography at Memorial University. And he had spent 25 years in the, in the North working in, with Northern communities and Northern peoples. So in 2010, the community where Shauna lives was experiencing like crazy weather, and it was the warmest warmest winter on record. It rained every day, whereas typically it would be minus 20 degrees Celsius every day. Um, and they went to Dr. Bell and they said, can you help us? So that's when Dr. and he had mentioned that, um, Dr. Bell had mentioned that to say that he had reached out to Dr. Christian Haas to help to help him. And Trevor um, somehow managed to come up with some research money first, which seems to be that it might be easier to get research money first than to be able to get the money to commercialize. So it's a little bit different, right? It's a whole different focus. So once he started to get some research dollars to come up with the solutions, so come up with the technology and really customize it for what the communities were looking at, he managed to get some more research dollars to put it in two pilot areas in Maine and in Pond Inlet, so Nunavut and Nunatsiavut. And then in 2016, Dr. Bell and his team applied for an Arctic Inspiration Prize. That Arctic Inspiration Prize was to open the social enterprise that Shauna and I talked about today. Once we had that $400,000 prize, which we could do whatever we wanted to do with it, have you ever heard the term, you need money to make money? So we had the money, the 400,000 from this prize that they believed in what we wanted to do. Dr. Bell took the inventions that he had done and basically said, we're gonna open a social enterprise and this Arctic Inspiration Prize money is going to help. So with that money in hand and the technology done prior in the research and development, then we were able to leverage that money to other funders to say, see, we're onto something good. And then we just made sure that what we presented was based on science and our, our history and what everything else, uh, you know, we had done all the backup and we worked hard. And then we were able to get the funding from other funders that were related to tourism, for example, health, climate change adaptation, uh, uh, business development. And so it's really a multi multidisciplinary approach as to where the funding comes from, because we're all about climate change, you can't get on the ice, there's, there's health implications about that, and then there's a business social enterprise piece of it, and then there's the climate change adaptation tool piece of it. So it's not just a one point ROM where we got the money, we really had to um, look at it holistically, which is which makes sense for social enterprise because we look at it holistically and it's not just a one road and a one sort of, it's one sight line. It's how can we help? And there's different ways to do that. So it was a bit of a long answer to your question, but if it's based on evidence and based on, um, you know, reputation and um, work we had done before, then we've been successful in getting the money that we needed to get so far. So yay, smart ice. <laughs> We've got a couple of questions from the chat. Sure. Um, somebody asked how they how we can stop the ice from melting and what can they do as a young person living in the south to help? How can we stop the ice from melting? Oh my heavens. Well, I'm not a climate change expert, but you know, we talk about the carbon footprint, right? We talk about so many cars driving and airplanes in the air and industry and reduce reuse. So if there's any scientists that are on here today that want to answer that question, go ahead. But as a as an individual, as a company, we can adhere to those best practices and then as individuals we can and I guess you know the sum all together maybe we can all make a difference in the world but if anybody wants to add to that that's here that's a scientist um, in this area please do and then and then Emily you can remind me of the second question if anybody speaks yep so what what can they do as a young person living in the south to help to help the north yeah I guess with the climate change and okay I'm gonna let Shauna answer that one 
Um, to me, I think um, the biggest one is just to spread awareness of what Caroline said about um, reduce, reuse, recycle, um, be resourceful with any materials that you have, but you also have a voice and you have a platform, uh, whether it's Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, so just put out reminders and support um, companies that, you know, help fight off and help bring aware of climate change. Um, and then the, there's a community online um, of people who talk about and um, how they can get involved with climate change and with helping um, the Arctic. I think it's really important to understand what's happening up there. So read, meet people, go on forums, do things just like this so you can understand what the issues are. I can talk about the Arctic, but I can't talk about um, Brazil. I don't know what's happening in Brazil. So I've learned a little bit today. So it's, uh, it's interesting to really define what the climate change is happening in whatever area you're, is, that you're in. So uh, get in the know, figure it out. Is there another one there, Emily? Yeah. Um, so what are the plans for this summer and any places we will be working next? Ooh, okay. So the summer is always the time to rest and renew because the ice seasons are very long. They run from November to July. Uh, equipment comes up out of the ice in town, everything gets uh, updated, software updates, maintenance, anything gets fixed, all that kind of stuff, because we're in our off season. People get trained. Um, we get to have a little bit of vacation, but of course we can't go anywhere because we're stuck in COVID. So we get to uh, rest and renew again. Um, and then we just prepare. We spend months preparing for the, for the ice season. So that was one question, what do we do? And then uh, Nikolai has a question as well. What was the second question? Oh, uh, uh, sorry, I don't know. Was there anybody else who had a question? No more. I think Emily had a second question for me, but I forgot that fast what it was. It's the end of the day here in Newfoundland. Sorry. Right. The places we're gonna be working next. Ah, okay. So our goal is to get all the way across Canada, like in every community. So there's probably 70 or 80 communities across Canada's north. So every year we add a couple of more communities, but it is a process. We have to engage with the communities first and we find the funding. And then we have to order and procure and make and train and deploy. And it takes, it's, it's not like ordering a Big Mac. <laughs> it takes a long time. Okay, Nikolai. Yeah, it actually comes in. Can you hear me? yes perfect yeah uh, it actually comes in um right perfectly right here i'm from denmark um and for the people who doesn't know it the uh, danish realm uh, stretches to greenland and the faroe islands but mm -hmm. so it's fun to sit here as a dane um being proud of the greenlandic uh, culture and the inuits that that is a part of the danish realm uh, and also there's always been this small void between the Can uh, canadian and, and the danish about which islands up north belongs to which country. Um, <laughs> so every year they're planting small flags, uh, the special forces, <laughs> forth and back, and it, it's never been a fight, it's just for fun. Anyway, so this was my question. Um, you say you want to uh, expand throughout Canada, but could mm -hmm. it be beneficial to also expand with Denmark or Greenland, because they are self-governing? Uh, Norway, Svalbard, and, and, and finally Russia, right? Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, I have my, my eyes set on, you know, international for sure. Our board of directors has said in the next couple of years, we'll focus on getting uh, across Canada more. We've done the initial research for which is U USA, obviously. And we've done some research in Greenland and Dr. Trevor Bell has traveled to Nook and has taken in some Arctic conferences and, and meetings over in Nook. Um, and it's interesting because the initial, uh, uh, the initial research is that the ice monitoring is done way better in Greenland than it is anywhere else. And they've got a really strong uh, background in how they, they monitor the ice. And the ice is, uh, they do a lot of um, agriculture culture and they the ice is used for animals to cross and like it's really really interesting what it's done so I think Greenland is quite interesting and it's an area that we definitely are we're informed of and we've got some contacts there and we've been there but uh, in in the realm of international business development uh, we we're, we're gonna like baby steps 
because we are a not-for-profit, we're social enterprise. We've got 25 people all across Canada and um, you know, it takes a lot of time. My former job prior to this, when I've been with the company since the doors opened three years ago, was I was a director for international business development for the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. And so it was, this is what I did. This is what I did every single day was international business development. And we had other people going to Greenland too. It's a great place. I've never been there, but it, I see pictures. It's beautiful. But yes, you're right on. There's other places too, all the way up around that circle, right? Yeah. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, there's another question. Does Smart Ice uh, get financial support from the Canadian government? We do, because the finance... Um, uh, the finances do come from different departments. So it could be health, climate change, adaptation, um, Crown Indigenous Northern Relations, transportation, like different inputs in different ways. Again, looking at it holistically. So the funding that we do get is really to fund bringing us into communities. So it, they don't, just don't give us money and say, ah, have at it, do what you want. The money that we get are, is in partnership with communities. And then we actually, it's for training, getting the equipment in and making it usable within the community. So yes, they're, they're, a, they're a big fan of ours as we are with them. <laughs> There's another question. Um, are there any laws that guarantee protection to Inuit people or other indigenous or traditional communities concerning climate change? Shauna, do you know this one? I don't, unfortunately. Yeah, I'm not sure if there's any laws in particular. Uh, Inuit Nunangat, which includes like right from Western Canada to the East is considered Canada. Uh, it, it's in Canada. So there would be Canadian laws. Um, but I think when we work with indigenous groups across the country, especially with uh, Inuit groups, there is um, best practices, there's reconciliation and self-determination that we would um, be very respectful and mindful of, of how we work within, within their territory. And we don't work with a community unless the community wants to work with us. So we have waiting lists of communities that call us to work with them. So engagement is critical uh, and we would never do it without that. So we're for the most part invited into the community and um, we, we steward, um, uh, we, we, we steward um, conservation of the lands and being very respectful of the land is very, very important and important to us as well. But laws, I'm not sure you'll have to, to look that up. Good question. I have a quick question. I'm curious, like through your process of going into different communities, if you've kind of changed your approach at all or if you've kind of like learned any lessons about sort of like how to engage those communities and work with them and also if you were to expand like internationally what of the core I guess approaches um would you take and how would they differ um I mean the first thing we would have to do is really research how communities communicate right and how, how to communicate so you know the first three, three things that we do when we go into a community is we listen and we listen and we listen <laughs> and we engage and listen some more. Um, one of the best practices that is kind of coming up a little bit for us is to work with a community organization within, within the community. So in Inuit Nunangat, for example, it could be the Hunters and Trappers Association or the Search and Rescue Association, or it's some you know, grounded, ground level, grassroots level organization where the people themselves make the decisions. So it's really, we facilitate, we enable it, um, and, but we're all about building the capacity of the people in the community and building the community's resilience, helping to do that. So always include, um, and augment the technology with traditional knowledge. The traditional knowledge trumps everything. The technology is just the medium and all of this stuff is the medium to get the social impacts, right? Because we're a social enterprise. So partnering is critical. Listening, 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 listening. Um, um, Sean and Emily have heard me say this before. Uh, if any of you, uh, do any of you do yoga? Maybe. 
No. So I'm a yoga teacher. And as I was learning, going through my program, my yoga teacher training, and one of the things that they said to us was always arrive on your mat with the beginner's mind. So it doesn't matter if I've been teaching for five years, I go to a yoga class tomorrow and I learn something new every time I, I go to my mat. So every time we go to community, we're there as, as learners. And while we may have some expertise in some things that we're willing to share, we're really a learner in that community. And so we have to be respectful and take the time to build the relationships. Um, the other best practice is boots on the ground. So Sarah, you got to show up and you got to show up again and you have to show up again. And you don't just walk into a community and say, I'm here, I got to fix this. This is, this is us. This is, this is not how this works, right? You go, you introduce yourself and you listen and you listen. So if you get in the theme of what I'm saying here is that we have a lot to learn and you be humble about that and show up. You have to show up because you need to make sure this community knows you're gonna come back and then you're gonna come back again and that what you say you're gonna do, you're gonna do. And by doing that, um, you'll be invited back to the community. Long way to answer that question, but it's not a simple A to B, it's like A to Z and then back again and around. It's just respect, major respect. Uh, there's another question. How can NGOs, INGOs, best support organizations like Smart Ice? Mm. Well, I think that uh, time, it takes time. And sometimes the funders don't realize how much time it takes. And then compound that by COVID. And then that's more time. Um, I have discovered that things in the northern the northern part of the country take a lot longer than mobilizing things in the southern part of the country. Um, can you imagine living and not having telephone for three weeks or no internet for a month or no flights coming in and out for two weeks? And so we have funders need to give time and be flexible. The other thing is that we work on ice season. So for any of you who work in an organization or a, or a company in Canada, and I don't know what it's like in the rest of the world, but in Canada, typically um, a fiscal year runs April 1st to March 31st. And it's not necessarily on a calendar year, which you'd think would, but they don't. So the seasons in funding from governments end March 31st. And you got to have all projects wrapped up by March 31st. Well, guess what? We have April and May and June still left in an ice season. So sometimes that flexibility is not there. Our ice seasons run right, you know, fiscal years stop in the middle of an ice season and that's really unhelpful. So multi-year funding is very, very helpful. Um, time and taking the time for people inside an organization to understand the organization like Smart Ice, who we serve, why we do what we do, and what a social enterprise is. Um, that's what a non-governmental, or that's what a, gov a government or a funding agency can, can consider. They can learn as well. They can come along for the journey versus saying, this is your criteria, fit it. Oh, and by the way, throw COVID on top of that. <laughs> Hopefully everybody on this call is very safe. Ah, gotcha, Amber. Um, I don't know where everybody's from. We've got Brazil, Switzerland, and Denmark so far. I'm also in St. John's, Newfoundland currently. Are, so. are you, Michaela? Okay. Yeah. Where are you and what are you studying or what are you doing or working? California. Uh, I attend MUN as well as a master's student looking at uh, moose and how they are uh, kind of affecting um, nutrient cycling and soil health. So moose are not native to Newfoundland for those who might not be from here. Um, oh. But I actually live uh, in the old uh, Battery Hotel. So oh, okay. Up on Signal Hill. <laughs> yeah. 
That's reduce, reuse, recycle for you. That used to be a hotel and now it's a graduate student residence. There you go. <laughs> exactly. I can now confidently say I've lived in a hotel room through a pandemic. So <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So we're getting somewhere here. Brazil, Switzerland, Denmark, St. John's, California, Ottawa, BC. So we got some Canadians, some international folks. Anything else in the chat there, Emily? Um don't see anybody i i miss california <laughs> i miss the beach <laughs> amber <laughs> it's really nice this time of the year <laughs> yeah well yeah sean and i michaela just saw blue sky about two hours ago for the first time in two weeks so <laughs> it's been rain drizzle and fog for two weeks Uh, if I may, I just want to update. Um, so I am originally from Denmark, but for love, I moved to uh, United States and then we ended up in Hawaii. So that's where we are right now. Hawaii? Uh, Hawaii, yeah. So in Kailua, <laughs> Kailua, Hawaii. And uh, yeah, um, I don't know, 85 degrees out is good. Anyways, I just wanted to say that um, if we can... Uh, so I come from Denmark originally, uh, live in Hawaii now. Uh, all states and nations that is surrounded by water. Um, so what we see here right now is obviously all the plastic that comes in uh, after all the storms. That's uh, one thing. Um, but the main problem here, now we talk about water and sea level rise, is that in the old days it was a smart idea to put the road and the railroad, rail, wow, you know what I mean, right? Yeah. Um, on the very coast, um, and uh, so they're disappearing now. So all the highways on these islands uh, and the residents, and you, I, you might imagine that it's not the local Hawaiians that owns the big million dollar properties next to the ocean today, but... No. So that's where we're at. Um, actually, these uh, 10, 20 million dollar mansions, that's what's disappearing right now. Um, and they don't want to give them up obviously. So they install all these hard structures, which we all know only last five to 10 years, and then they have to do it all again. Wow. Yeah. So I just wanted to share that in the name of yeah. talking about climate change. Yeah, it's, uh, we're seeing it throughout our province. And I mean, Emily or Sean or Michaela, because she lives here, you would know, I mean, you know, we're, we just had massive rain. And um, there's a highway that is like completely washed out by Springdale. And it's, it's, um, it's like, it's crazy. We've never, I've never experienced any of this in our winters. And for those of you in California, Hawaii, <laughs> our winters would start like in October, you know, at Halloween, it, it, October 31st, and you'd be having your snowsuit on and you're trucking around with, with a costume and your winters would last till April or May. We didn't have snow till sometime in January and basically it was gone in March. And this is unheard of you know, for this, this white right. And when I was a little girl, there was nothing to have snow right from the sidewalk up to my bedroom window on the second floor. It's just, it's so, so, so different. We have hurricanes now. Um, the weather in the fall is just crazy. It's just crazy. Cause you just don't know from one day to the next, we could have 30 centimeters of snow. And then the next day we're out in t-shirts shoveling it. <laughs> So it's, if nobody believes in it, it's, uh, it's crazy. Ah, there's a good question. How are you experiencing? It's not for me though, because I'm not in the Mediterranean. Emily, do you want to read the question? Yep. Um, I think it's directed to Quinn. Uh, oh no, I'm not sure. Valeria, maybe. How are you experiencing climate change in the Mediterranean? Or young, maybe. There we go. I think it was for me. Yep. Uh, oh. Yeah, it is a very different situation, of course, but uh, it's also water at the very end. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it is very experienced, very different in the European part of the Mediterranean and the African and Eastern side. Uh, but I guess instead what we have are droughts, uh, drier seasons and 
uh, also more tropical storms, which uh, change a lot our access to water and how the system regulates itself and regulates forests and and the ecosystems. Yeah, well, it, it is not about transportation or safety, as you notice that much, but um, safety on, on food and water. Yeah. 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 Well, in Inuit Canada, in Inuit Nunangas, uh, well, I guess in indigenous, uh, in lots of indigenous communities, access to food is, is a really big thing, right? And so what they call country food, so foods that you would hunt, whether that be, um, you know, any kind of fish or mammal or, um, you know, caribou or wherever you are, it, they can't get to the hunting grounds. And um, it's, it's not great because the community food is very important. And when you're looking at the types of, of how expensive it is to fly food to these communities, and Quinn, you said you lived in Nunavut, uh, then you know how expensive things are up there. And if I was to ask Shauna today, how much is a carton of milk, a two liter carton of milk in Nain? I mean, here in St. John's, it's about 335 for two liters of milk. And how much would it be in Nain? I know how much it was the last time I spent it in Nain. I bought it in Nain. It was Seven, seven to nine dollars. Yeah, about nine. Yeah, it was like nine, nine fifty or something when I bought two liters of milk. So that's almost three times the cost because everything has to be flown in. And um, so it's the dollar access, right? So there's, there's like employment is not, there's not a lot of places to be employed. Um, and then it's just cost, it just costs so much. If um, Yeah, so country food is really, really important, really important. Yeah, you can't live on frozen pizzas every day either. <laughs> yeah, Michelle, you see that, right? When you're home. Mm -hmm. yeah. Quinn, do you have anything to add to that? Because I think it was you, Quinn, that said that you lived in Nunavut. Now I'm putting Quinn on the spot here. Quinn may not want to speak. And that's okay. Yeah. Yes, there was a program that you could buy food from the grocery store in bulk. Yeah, so it was a special order. That's right. So there's sea lifts a couple of times a year. And but you got to have money. You got to have money to buy bulk groceries, you know, thousands of dollars worth of groceries to last you for the full year. So if you don't have that money, then sea lift is, um, you know, your winter sea lift is, is not possible. First time I ever went to Rigolette, um, no, it was McCovic and I stayed in a hotel and I went downstairs for supper because that's all, you, you know, that's what you do. And they had five freezers in the kitchen and it was just full of froze. It was just frozen, frozen. Everything was frozen and nothing was, it was, nothing was fresh, nothing. And I, I nearly about passed out. But anyway, I thought, okay, I didn't think of that, right? We were, it just didn't occur to me that everything that I had to have was frozen. But anyway. That's, that's it, it's reality. Yeah. Are there any more questions or comments? Um, uh, anyone's uh, welcome to share anything that they've learned or any thoughts that they have. Um, you can do so in the chat or you can turn on your mic. Oh, you're welcome, Valeria. It's not every day I can say, oh, I chatted with Valeria in Brazil today. <laughs> or Switzerland, or California. <laughs> yeah, it's not very common that Brazilians get uh, interested in um subjects as this one about ice conditions and melting and, and etc because we don't have this kind of problem in here but actually we have uh different problems that you might not face um in the past few years we have faced several fires here in brazil and serious droughts as as well so I guess each of us, it doesn't matter where we are. It doesn't matter if I'm here in Brazil or for example, if Nikolai is in Hawaii or if you are in Canada, we are all getting affected by the climate change and this is real. And I still can't understand why there are people all over the world denying it as well. But 
it makes me happy that uh, we are here discussing it and there are people as us that uh, are really working for um, uh, to, to fight the climate change. So this makes me happy. There's a, a light in the end of the tunnel. So I would like to thank you again, all of you, not only the presenters, but also people who are engaged here because it makes me happy. So thank you again for all the sharing and all the learning. Oh, you're quite welcome. We're delighted to spend the afternoon with you. Oh, thanks, Elise. Yeah, it was great to do that. Ram's got his hand up. Yes, and to second on that, you know, I, I think uh, you already demonstrated how to to, to take advantage of, uh, of, uh, of, of challenges and turn them into uh, something positive. And I think, be it, um, you know, sometimes I, I meet some friends and they're not convinced. They're, they're telling me, oh, there's nothing such as climate change. Oh, that's just a, it's a hoax, blah, blah, blah. I always think, I always think you know, um, whether it's, true i think it's true it's happening i can see it myself you know but uh um whether it's not true you know it's an opportunity to change the way we we actually uh organize ourselves and i think it's like a bit like uh, you know like a living room you can have a mess and live in this mess or you can tidy it up and and take advantage of reorgan reorganizing yourself and and creating like something what you did you know you created opportunities and that's uh, I think that's very positive especially for for young people or people are still young in in the way they act and the way they keep being active and I think that's that's the I see a lot of um, I mean it's it's amazing the way you 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 demonstrated how to to make a positive impact uh, for, for everybody uh, uh, at the local level. So that's uh, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, we all work hard and uh, you know, I'm, I'm the oldest, right? <laughs> well, I'm surrounded by amazing, incredible youth with such great ideas. And uh, it's, it's, it's a great place to be and a great place to work. And you've got people like Emily and Shauna around that are, um, you know, that are super, but uh, we are very proud of what we do. And it's, it's the whole social enterprise piece that really resonates with everybody's values as well. And so when I hire, I hire for values, right? You can learn skills, but you have to make sure the right person fits in, fits in the organization and the values are there. So do they believe in climate change? Do they believe in, in indigenous reconciliation? Do they believe in working together as a team? And I think when you've got a team like this, um, we can make a difference. And I think the social impacts are something that we're incredibly passionate about. So thanks for that, Rob. So thank you everybody for staying on and having a chat with us. It was uh, really great that you decided to spend your afternoon with us. So uh, I'm here in Newfoundland and Labrador. So for those of you that are around the world are not quite sure with where we are, then have a look on the map and find us. It's now almost five o'clock here in the evening. So supper time for us, the end of our day. And I know only midday for some of you or early, maybe earlier morning for Hawaii. So stay safe. Hopefully you're not in COVID ridden areas or you're gonna just wash your hands, cover your face. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye Thank and you. keep in touch. Look up Smart Ice.
Hey team, that was so good. <laughs> Did you enjoy that? I thought it was awesome. Um, I thought the questions were really good and you guys like answered them really well and the presentation was so dynamic. Like I liked the video clips and the audio clips and the music in the background and the visuals. Yeah, top notch. <laughs> Excellent. All right, how do you feel, Shana? I feel good. I liked it. We did we did really well today. <laughs> <laughs> what about what about you, Emily? Any are you feeling good about that? And yeah, it's great. You guys did a great job. Yeah. Emily's we're we're gonna train Emily to do this one day. <laughs> should she want to? I say that and I always qualify it as should she want to. We don't twist. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, Elise, if you can find, if there's any feedback that comes back from the organization or like, I don't know if they do surveys or anything like that. If you, if you hear of anything, could you share it with us? Yeah, I definitely will. And I took some screenshots throughout the presentation that I'll send your way to. Okay. Um, it's kind of fun. And then, yeah, I'll let you know about any feedback that I hear from them. I'm sure they're kind of doing that piece of things. And I think there's like a workshop report or something like that um, that I'll send you if you haven't been sent it um, as workshop facilitators I can forward that on to you um, and yeah we can like work on it together or um, if that's out of capacity then I can like work on it but getting answers from you guys um, okay. yeah I'll uh, forward all that your way though great now we can breathe <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But that's neat. I mean, I think when we make a post on social media, right? I mean, we had people from Switzerland, Brazil, Hawaii, uh, you, you know, California, um, across Canada, Saskatchewan, BC, Ottawa, Newfoundland. And there was, there was consistently like 25, 26 people. Some people would drop out and come back in and then some people stayed for only half, but yeah. that's pretty good. Yeah for live yeah. and then we'll get the stats on like who all has watched it too. So we'll see like how many views the actual YouTube link gets too. Okay. Um, Cause a lot of people are gonna be watching it after the summit is done. They're gonna release all of this, the sessions. And I know within our delegation, a bunch of people don't have time to watch during the day cause they're working. So they're right. gonna watch when all the videos are launched after the April 16th. Um, right, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm hoping they'll get rid of all this stuff. They will. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, right. I'll double check, but they definitely will. Yeah. Um, okay. And then we'll have a better handle on like reach and yeah, who all we were able to. Right. Okay. Well, okay. Emily, thank you for coordinating all this with Elise, and thank you. I really appreciate the invite to do this. Mm. Yeah, and thank you all for de delivering such a top-notch presentation and like sharing your experience with the organization and just your personal experience as well um, and handling all those pretty big questions. <laughs> yeah, there were really some pretty big ones. And, yeah. uh, you know, just keep, keep these two lovely ladies in mind about the fact that they're alumni and students on ICE. And uh, if there's anything else that Smart ICE can, can do with you, we, we're happy to do that. And... Uh, um, you know, I was thrilled to know that they were both alumni, you know, when I learned, well, I knew I was, and then I found out that Emily was, so that's pretty cool. I wouldn't mind going to the students on ice <laughs> presentation or on a, on a cruise. That would be really nice. I <laughs> yeah. Canceled, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. We'll definitely keep you guys in mind and, um, let you know about opportunities, but we also know that like, life could be a lot and so um definitely let us know if we do reach out for an opportunity if it's beyond your capacity because we don't want to overwhelm you with so many opportunities as well as sometimes we can do <laughs> yeah i know i know we 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 we, we typically say yes we got to say no <laughs> yeah, yeah but we really appreciate um yeah working with you guys and connecting again with the alumni part of it but also just an organization that's so connected to students on ice it feels like <laughs> i know it's cool <laughs> it's cool yeah. all right okay everybody have a good night yeah, <laughs> Time to take breathe easy yeah yeah, yeah.
Well done. <laughs> All right. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Okay. Good job. You guys are awesome.